Is it cheating to fortify mead, wine, cider, and beer? Let's talk about that and a few other things today on CSB Unpasteurized. All right, so something that comes up pretty often on our channel is, uh, well, first, I have notes. So you know this is, like, important, right? First thing is freeze distillation, or um, there's so many different names for it, but it is freeze distilling, okay? This comes up all the time, and um, it gets a little bit frustrating. So here's, here's, here's a, a prequel to this topic. If a thing was legal and we knew that you wanted to learn about it and it was part of our realm of expertise or what we were doing and trying to share with you, we would 110% do that and show that and put it on our platform. Yeah, there's a reason why we don't distill on our show too. Come on, however... If a thing is illegal, like a felony illegal, we're not going to publicly display that thing. It just doesn't make sense. It's wrong. Now, on to the legality or whatever there is for freeze distillation or however name you want to give to it. Essentially, the U.S. law states that if you raise the alcohol by any means other than fermentation, you are distilling. Distilling cannot be done legally in the home, period, end of statement. So you'd have to have a distiller's license, which just by default means you have to have a distillery, like a large building that you do this in. Well, a building that you do this in doesn't have to be large, I guess. It could be a little distillery. I don't know the square footage. Yeah, I don't know what the minimums are. are, but I know it can't be a home. <laughs> right, it has to be so, a separate building. right there, we have a couple of problems. A, we're not distillers. B, we don't own another building. So we cannot do this at all, and it is considered illegal. Now, a lot of people have been saying, oh, well, it's one of those things that they don't really care. Okay, well, they don't really care, maybe, possibly. Is it completely illegal? Who knows? But here's the thing. We do this for a living. I don't really want to jeopardize my entire existence and career to produce freeze distilling videos. And I know lots of people have their own concepts of how this is defined and what is actually distilling and that free distilling, free distilling either is applicable to distilling or not. But if you, if you just break it down, just think logically, just work with me here for a moment, okay? If you have a beverage and it's a certain amount of concentrated alcohol and so you use a method to remove the alcohol from the water. Or the water from the alcohol. Either way is applicable. It doesn't matter if you're boiling it, if you're freezing it, if you're using rainbows. I don't care. It's it's still technically unicorn alcohol raising method. Distilling because you're yeah. concentrating the alcohol, removing that water, right? Okay. So if you just think about it that way, then sure, freeze distilling falls under the category of distilling because it's still distilling. And that's part of a gray area. And I think that's where lots of our viewers yeah. are questioning the legalities or illegalities of it is that it, it's it's not what they understand distilling to be because they think you need a, a still, a pot still right. or whatever type of still. But the process is just a different way of distilling. Right. I mean, with true distilling, you are removing the water. Well, wait, you are removing the alcohol and distilling the alcohol separately and leaving the water behind, hopefully, because it should evaporate first. I'm not going to get into the whole science of it because that's not really what we do. But you're removing the alcohol. With freeze distilling, you're actually removing the water, but the end result is the same a higher concentration of alcohol. Well, if you think about it, even in the still, the, the alcohol vapors are what concentrate into the secondary mm -hmm. uh, vessel, where with freeze distillation, it is the water that freezes and the alcohol that doesn't. Right. So you pour off the alcohol. So it's, yep. it's actually very similar if you think about it that well, way. Well, the end result is the same. Yeah. How they get there is two different ways. That's all. Um, I have read some anecdotal stories um, I like that word anecdotal, by the way. You'll hear that a lot today. <laughs> I have read some stories of people who actually called the TTB and tried to ask. Now, one person asked over a couple of day period. They they had called several times and they got the same person or a couple different people. I'm not sure on the details. It was several years ago. And essentially, they were told, no, it's fine. You can do that. Okay. Now, that's the actual alcohol tobacco board. 
Another person more recently, this was less years ago, called and in the beginning of the conversation, it sounded like they were being told it's okay. And then there was one question that was asked by the agent, and I forget what the question was. And immediately the answer was, no, that's distilling, it's illegal. So even if it depends on who you get at the, a the TTB, I still don't feel the need to put our whole channel in jeopardy to be able to produce it for you. I know other people have done it, and you know what? People do all kinds of stuff on the internet. doesn't make it the smartest thing to do. And there, there's a problem here inherent that I think was illustrated by Brian's story of the phone calls, is that there's the human element that's incorporated into that. And so different people are going to define things differently and their understanding right. of the law may be more encompassing or more narrow. So uh, the basics of it is we don't want to risk it. We don't yeah. want to go to jail and we don't want our channel to close, shut down because then we won't be able to share this stuff with you. Exactly. So that's why we don't do it. Never mind the fact that you are concentrating methyls and other things that aren't necessarily good for you. So while it's not probably dangerous to consume, it probably will give you a pretty nasty hangover if you drink too much. I mean, I know any alcohol can do that, but this stuff, it's so concentrated because it's not truly distilled. It's like a dirty distillation process, really. So it's just concentrating everything. Now, I know somebody's going to mention that there's a beer out there that they actually do remove some of the, like they freeze it and they remove some of the water and that way they raise the alcohol level. And that is legal. It's done under very specific circumstances. I think they can only raise it by a point or two of alcohol, I think. Don't, don't hold me to that. But someone else mentioned to me, well, if that were illegal, then you wouldn't be able to make, I think it was Icebox at home. Well, I looked it up and you can't. It, you can't make that at home either. So a lot of people have a lot of ideas about distilling and, and freeze distilling that um, check with your local laws. Really look it up. I've heard from hundreds of people in the time that our channels existed that home distilling is legal everywhere up to a certain amount. No, that's completely not true. You have to check your local laws because just look it up. It's really, really simple. For us, I look up distilling at home in Florida and boom, we're not even allowed to have a still. So be really, really careful before you just assume something is legal. Um, make sure for yourself that you know what you're doing before you uh, make the choice to do or not do things that may or may not be illegal where you may or may not live. Anyway, that's the end for freeze distilling. We're done with that for today. Now, a recent comment that came up, and this this turns into a whole other discussion, but <laughs> you know, that's why we do these kind of shows where we could just kind of talk unpasteurized. There was a comment left on our channel just last night on our 30% ABV meat. And they called us a couple of names and said we were stupid and that we were wannabe chemists because we didn't know the reason why it stalled was that when you mix honey and water, it makes peroxide, as they said, but it's actually hydrogen peroxide, and that kills yeast. And I went, wow, other than your presentation, that's a very interesting idea. Let me check into that, because I had heard something about this in the past. It's part of the reason why honey is believed to be so good at being an antiseptic. However... There's a couple of issues here that are interesting, and it leads us to our third topic for today, too. But let me just talk about this a little bit. What he was claiming is that when you mix honey and water together, it creates hydrogen peroxide, and that kills the yeast. Sounds very simple on the surface. Well, how do you prevent it from creating hydrogen peroxide? He suggested you boil the honey, and that made me go... Maybe that's why they used to always boil the honey. And then I went, wait a minute. Did people really know that it made hydrogen peroxide a thousand years ago? I don't think so. So that got me digging even more. And then we talked to our admins and a couple of our friends. One of them happens to be a librarian who's really good at researching stuff and looking things up. And she said that there's actually some that say honey becomes toxic when it's heated past 140 degrees Fahrenheit. I went, well, wait a minute. We have a little problem here. If you can't heat it because it's going to become toxic, but if you don't heat it, it's going to make hydrogen peroxide and kill your yeast. How did we ever make mead in the first place? I mean, not we, the collective we. How did the world ever make mead? So I thought there's got to be something wrong here. 
Derek is being kind of quiet because I did most of the research on this one. Sorry. But she's going to chime in every now and then. Here is the thing. That guy is right. It does create hydrogen peroxide but it's in very, very small quantities. And there's a lot of compounds in honey. It was long believed that the hydrogen peroxide producing uh, compounds were what made it so good as an antibiotic. Well, in actual studies, when they actually dissected it and measured, they found that, well, A, hydrogen peroxide does in fact kill yeast, but in what concentration? The concentration is what's important. They found that the concentrations needed to kill most yeast, bacteria, whatever, when you do it with honey and water, it is a magnitude of 900 times less than what is needed to kill them. In other words, it's such a very small, minute amount being produced that it probably has almost zero effect, okay? And two, hydrogen peroxide is H2O2 and breaks down quite readily into water and oxygen to the point that people actually use hydrogen peroxide to fix over sulfiding. Like say you used Camden tablets or something like that, and you have too much sulfites in there, they will use hydrogen peroxide to help break that down. It doesn't make the nicest smell in the long run, but it will actually help get rid of some of the sulfites and things like that and improve the brew. I don't know the whole science on that. I just kind of skipped that, but I saw it and went, okay, so people are doing this. They're adding hydrogen peroxide to their brews on purpose. Therefore, it can't be a, that much of a problem. I think because it's so volatile and breaks down so quickly. But that leads us to the other aspect. So the other aspect was a study, I think, done quite a while back. And it, it's kind of antidotal. So it's like, how much is this is just storytelling passed through the generations and how much of it is well, You're saying actual study. It wasn't really a study. Test. They did an observation yes. of heating honey and treating bees with the heated honey. So there, there's a practice in beekeeping as my understanding, and I don't know this for a fact, so I'm just expressing my understanding of the scenario is that, uh, to calm bees, sometimes when you're moving them or working with the hive, you will spray them with honey and they will... Yeah, it's like a diluted honey water. So, this is new to me. I've never heard this one before. I so was apparently they get busy cleaning themselves with the honey or dealing with the honey. and Calms them down. I don't know. Uh, so one group did a heated honey and they noticed that instead of calming the bees, they actually killed the bees. And so this led to... Uh, more thought on this the subject, and there was rats involved. Yes, they did some tests on rats and mice, but again, high concentrations of this stuff of heated honey, and they too passed. they let it cool first. I'm sure. Uh, so this this led to certain studies within uh, the medical tradition of Ayurveda. Ayurveda, uh, saying that that concluded that the honey was toxic. Right. And I think the biggest problem here isn't whether the honey was toxic or not, but rather an issue of semantics and translation. I believe that uh, uh, the study of foods and the interactions of, of things that you ingest into your body and how it affects your overall well-being and the, the Ayurvedic... Ayurvedic. Ayurvedic. Yeah. yeah. It's hard to say. <laughs> I, I keep looking to Brian when I say that word because I know I'm going to pronounce it wrong. I they can't see wrong. that, though. Well, no, some can. Some, some people can. are watching. Other watching, people are listening. Hi, if you're, not, if you're listening, she was looking at me. I was looking at Brian. <laughs> Making eyes at me, all kinds of things. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's, it's not so much a this is bad for you, but it's not good for you. And so honey in its raw form, unpasteurized, unheated, unadulterated, has many very helpful and healthful benefits to it. And that's why they would present it that this is a good thing. And then when you heat it, pretty much all of those additional benefits are destroyed. Depends on the temperature and time, but right. yeah, it does. Eventually. So therefore it's no longer a good thing. So could that translate to now it's toxic rather than it's actually toxic? That is a high probability in my belief. But again, I, I don't know, and I didn't do the studies and I don't know how actual of length of studies or lack thereof was done. But it, it seems like 
primarily, in my understanding and research of that type of medicine, is that if it's good for you, it's good for you. If it's not good for you, then we're just going to put it over on the other side to avoid. And that avoidance could be translated as toxic. In other words, the, it became, um, as she said, semantics. But if you think about this, if it was a few hundred years ago to a thousand years ago, and we don't really know if this is how it came about, we just have this as a story of how it came about. If someone watched bees die because heated honey was put on them, they make the connection, then they test it on rats and mice. Well, here's the thing. Some of the compounds called HMF are actually beneficial to humans, but maybe they're probably not to rats and mice, especially in the dosages that they would have used. So it doesn't necessarily jump over to humans, but it comes down to this simple thing, saying, this is not good for you. Now, that can be taken a couple different ways. You can say, this is not good for you, as in, that's bad for you. This is not good for you, right? That's bad for you. Or, this is not good for you, meaning it's neutral. It's not a positive thing. It's not beneficial. But it doesn't necessarily make it harmful. I think over the years, that term just became, it causes harm rather than no benefit. And today, it's toxic. Even though some of the... Not the study that showed all the other stuff that we researched, but other sites on the internet are saying it causes things as as dangerous as killing you. It's fatal. Comma, however, this entire conversation, this subset of whether it's good for us or bad for us, is immaterial to the topic at hand. Because the topic of hand is what's best for yeast. Right. Yeast are not people. I'm sorry, yeast. You're something different. Maybe you should take that as a compliment. I don't know if heated honey or regular honey is better for the yeast. And that's that, an interesting concept that, and, that had not actually and that, entered my mind. That's the topic at hand. That's well, yeah. I mean, we're, we're, we're brewers, you know, yeah. what does this really matter? Um, but at the same token, I was concerned because as soon as I heard the 140 degree Fahrenheit number, I went, wait a minute. We teach people to pasteurize at 140 degrees. We are, in fact, telling people to heat honey to 140 degrees. If this is toxic. I want to know so that we can correct this. Well, it turns out every study done in the Western side of the world says, nope, there's no harm coming from honey that has been heated. So there you have it. Everything that I found says no. The only things that say there are are anecdotal evidence from hundreds, if not thousands of years ago by people who observed something rather than actually doing any study on it. I just want to make that clear. Don't worry about heating your honey. Granted, I wouldn't heat it too far because you do destroy a lot of the good stuff in it. And as one person said, the only way that you can actually make honey dangerous is if you heat it so much that it turns into just pure carbon. And then it's probably just going to taste bad. <laughs> okay. I can go along with that. But it comes down to the other thing that we were talking about is that hydrogen peroxide. So Basically, both theories have some amount of truth to them, and both theories are inapplicable and kind of don't even matter for mead making and using honey and brewing, because the hydrogen peroxide concentration is so low that it doesn't even matter. And then the heating the honey destroys some good stuff, but it doesn't actually make it toxic. So, And we also don't know how much of the good stuff is still left once yeah. the fermentation process is complete, because we're making alcohol. And I'm pretty sure alcohol could easily fall into the toxic category as well. We don't talk about such things. So both of those topics, they're both right and they're both wrong at the same time. So a takeaway from that last conversation, which I hope we kind of glossed over, but I would like to put some emphasis on there. Go for it. Is that we are 110% open to starting a dialogue, to having a oh. conversation about something that we may not know. Yep. We're not experts. We're not the all and knowing of oh, everything. Oh, I see where you're going now. So if you have found some information that perhaps we're lacking, please let us know in the comments. Say, hey, guys, have you heard of this? Or would you? what do you think about this? And as you can see by this conversation, we will research the beep out of it, okay? I didn't even have to censor that. We're, 
We have a team of people who live for research. Yeah. I live for research. Brian loves research. Our admins love research. And we're all over the world. And so we are going to dig. We're going to find every little tidbit we can about that. As long as you approach the topic in a reasonable fashion. If you start off by calling us names and insulting our intelligence, yeah. that's no longer a conversation. That's an infantile, childish, romper room, playground and activity. That That's not a conversation and we're not going to continue. But it's interesting because... We've seen this a few times where people want to tell us that we're doing something wrong. And they, in fact, do tell us. And sometimes they're right. Um, in this case, he was sort of right. But they approach it by immediately name calling and being about as belligerent as they can be. Now, my question is, what did they expect to come of that? Because when I correct someone, like if I see somebody making a statement um, in our VIP group or in a, or whatever, where it's incorrect, it's it's misinformation, I try to approach it in a nice way and say, hey, just so you're aware, this is incorrect. And this is actually the way that works and blah, blah, you know, that kind of thing. Try to educate and inform rather than condemn. Because if I just went in there as a jerk, that person is much less likely to actually listen to what I have to say. My And at the end of the day, our goal is to educate and inform. So if I push them away from that, then what's the point in what I was trying to do in the first place? So, yeah, just if you have something to say, say it, but, you know, be respectful. We're all people. There's no reason for the Internet to be a nasty place. That's right. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> And I'd like to take this opportunity to brag on Brian. Yes, uh -oh. he didn't know this was coming, but I had it planned from the uh -oh. very beginning because I'm devious. <laughs> so Brian, and I don't know if you've noticed this, hopefully you have, has been answering diligently uh -oh. or responding or hearting or, or interacting in some format to all of the comments on City Setting Brews. So... It doesn't matter how old the video is. We get notifications that somebody has left a message. Um, some of the messages get hidden, but Brian has figured out how to work around that. Yeah, and try to find stuff. everybody's yeah. comments to they make sure. They take a little sure. longer for me to find. So, so he's he's working pretty much nonstop every single day, even the weekends, to to find and if not answer you right away, take a mental note so that he can make sure he can get back to you as soon as possible. And so we want to work with you. We want to encourage you. We want to inspire you. We want to help you and aid you in any manner possible. And if you're talking to someone on our channel, on YouTube, you're talking to Brian, okay? So just keep that in mind. Yeah, she really doesn't do the comments. And and remember, there's there's real people on the other end, and we're there for you. Yeah, um, that's the whole thing. You know, we we've realized that this is this is not just our channel. This is a community. This is you guys' channel. Many people have said, "Do what you want. It's your channel." Well, that doesn't really apply because without you, there's no channel. If we don't get the views, if we can't support ourselves by doing this, we're not going to do it. So that's the way any business works. And I'm sorry to be a little bit raw about that, but that's the truth. We're a business, you know, then we treat this like a business, which means we want to provide a good service to our customers. That would be you guys. And in turn, you tell us what you like and don't like with your dollars, which in your case is your eyes. If you don't watch a video, we kind of get the hint. All right. They didn't like that one so much. So we work on making other things that you do like. And that's why we put out polls and we ask for you know, comments and questions and opinions. We want to hear what you have to say. We don't want you to tell us what you think the channel needs or what you think everybody else wants. If I say, what do you think? I want you to tell me what you think. And I know a few people have shown some frustration and feel like that we're not actually listening or paying attention. And I'm sorry you feel that way, but we are 110% paying attention and watching and reanalyzing and reassessing. And even if it's something that's really near and dear to us and that we think, oh, this is the best thing ever, if we see from your reaction that, no, you aren't really into that thing. You know, like the booze bulletin last week. We're going to let it go. Yep. It doesn't matter what our investment is, both monetarily and time-wise. We're going to let it go working. if it's not working for you. Yep. So keep that in mind, that we are paying attention. We are listening to you, and you are very important to us. Yes. Which leads us up to our fourth 
fourth topic for this? Wow. We're only supposed to do like two or three, we okay? Didn't, we didn't number these. I don't know. No, I didn't number them because I, 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 no numbers. No numbers. No. Numbers are bad. I do enough math in the other videos, okay? These are supposed to be off the cuff, you know, that kind of thing. Anyway, this, the whole talk about freeze distilling and everything led us up to the next thing. And that is, is fortifying wine, meat, cider, and beer cheating? And go. All right. So this one actually triggers me. Normally, that's why I let her go. Brian first. is the one that gets triggered by certain things because he he has a paladin mentality. And for those of you who are fellow gamers, yay, high fives! But yeah, Brian is a paladin, and so not necessarily the lawful good paladin. This is but a this paladin. is how things should be. And if somebody questions how those things should be, I'm going to research and make sure that my perception of how things should be should are as they should be. And then he finds out, yes, he was correct. And then you're just in his way now and he will Don Quixote you with, you know. Your opinion is no longer valid. Where I'm a druid and I'm just like, <laughs> oh, well, it's just nature's way, whatever. You know, that's your problem. And that sounds really harsh, but that's that's the dichotomy oh, yeah. of our relationship. That's our... our She's a let it go. Don't worry about it. Yeah. I, I don't care what people think. I'm, and I'm more I'm like, no, we can't have people thinking the wrong thing. That, no, that, no. Uh-uh. We have to fix that. But this topic, the fortifying thing. She had to check. Oh, my gosh. It's just... Our 30% mead, um, quite a few people have expressed their disappointment in us for doing that video. They were quite verbose. Yeah. And creative. And the funny thing insults. is, that, was, <laughs> that wasn't even the first time we fortified. Like, we've done it before. I know. And it's just, it's interesting because there are things like, you know, port, sherry, vermouth. Yeah, um, that was my point. You stole my point. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Make your point. I will shut up now. <laughs> No, it is fine. It is just that there are beverages out there that are required by their essence, by yeah. what they are, to be fortified by an outside spirit. Yeah. That That's how they are created. That's how they've come to be. Most of them start as a wine base, and then they're fortified by a specific spirit in a specific region, and they become what they are. And as Brian already mentioned, some of them, port, vermouth. Um, brandy, There's, uh, brandy is distilled. Brandy's distilled. Okay. So it's, but it's still a wine that then got distilled. Right? Oh yeah, yeah. Right. So, okay. So that's, that's different, but yes, my bad. That's okay. Um, you're excited. I get it. Regardless. It just because we added a spirit to a brew doesn't mean that we cheated. It doesn't mean that we didn't make mead. As far as I know, in my research on the topic of mead, which has been quite extensive, there is no separate word for a fortified mead. Yeah. Whereas... We would uh, just call it fortified mead. Sherry and Port and Vermouth mm -hmm. um, have Their separate styles, words yeah. because they're very regional specific and they're very... They have parameters where mead is more kind of worldwide right but and even that which is another topic that we'll have to get to in another discussion <laughs> oh boy yeah that's next time yeah we'll have to take a note to, to i will what is mean or whatever um so dance mod and we use that as as a as by the way in case anyone's curious we say dance mod but it's actually dance mude dance mude dance mude uh, it's just harder to say, yeah. you know, my American tongue gets twisted and I get a knot in the side and it, it get a cramp. I would in my love jaw. to learn all the languages. If I had a wish for yeah. my brain or to, to know all the languages and be able to pronounce them correctly, I can't pronounce English correctly. Let's, let's be honest, shall we? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> they fortify all of. Almost um, all. I think I'm pretty sure everything, but I don't know that for a fact. So let's true. say many. Many of their brews to get them into a higher ABV range because they know that that's what their audience is craving. And it is important for them as a business. But it's more than that. They do it so that they can ma maintain a more natural way of doing it so they don't have to use chemical right. stabilization right. That's an or pasteurization. Thing. I think that's why they do it. And I believe in the. Ye olden times when people were making the first ports and vermouths and things like that, I'm betting you they did it for the same reason. They probably realized that if we mix alcohol with this wine that's not done fermenting yet, 
it keeps the alcohol, but it makes stable. it sweet. They can, sh- they can ship it. And, yeah, but it makes it sweet sure. too. Yeah. Because like a lot of your ports and things like that are very sweet wines. So that makes sense to me that that's a reason why they would have done it. Yeah. And that's why we did it too. We just happened to try to get it to go dry and then fortified afterwards. Right. And if you haven't watched the 30% mead video, I highly suggest that you do because... Have a calculator ready. Personally, so I along. think not only was it educational, but it was quite hysterical. Our intent in doing this was just to come to that number. We actually perceived that it was going to taste really, really bad. Spoilers... That may or may not have been the case, but I'm not going to tell you because you have to watch the video. It was awesome. (laughs) Just go watch the video. It was awesome. I'm not going to tell you what numbers we gave it, but it was awesome. Now, something else that came up along that too. um, A couple of people asked, because I added more volume in honey, did I actually go below 30%? They might be right. We don't know exactly how much honey we added. So... If I added more than, say, three or four ounces of honey, it's possible that we went below 30%. I am not going to go too crazy over it because we've done videos on how accurate is ABV calculation at home anyway. So, you know, anything along the way, a point or two here or there, could have thrown it a point to a point below, a point above to a point below that 30% mark. Um, I mean, technically, they're right. And you know what? We're going to address that in future videos when we start back sweetening. I'm going to show you guys just how it does actually reduce the ABV of your total brew by back sweetening. But it's not by as much as you might think. It affects higher ABV brews much more than lower. So that 30% is much more uh, volatile for change because, you know, zero versus 30 is a big difference versus zero versus, say, 10% or 12%. It's just not going to be that big of a difference. But it is something to uh, consider. And if if you really want to be more accurate, it is something important to know. So we're going to try to address that. In in that particular video, we were already so numerically intensive on how to combine the different ABVs and the different volumes together to create that magical 30% that, yes, we, we, we figured... Adding another element another of the volume chalk of the board honey with another hand would be too order. much, and so yep. yeah, cats and dogs living together, mass hysteria. Yeah, so that pretty much. I mean, I hope that clears up the whole fortification is cheating thing. I mean, is it something that I would consider one hundred percent necessary for a mead? No, no, of course not. I see it as just another technique that you yep. can use. Now. The 30% thing, let's be honest, that was just a stunt, okay? It was a meme. I mean, in most cases, you know, it's, oh, we used a 15% um, tolerant yeast. All right, it's at 30, 13%. We want to sweeten it. All right, so fortify it to 16 or 17. It's not going to ferment anymore, and you're done. You're not using very much alcohol to get there, so it's no big deal. The 30% mead, though, we actually said in the first, like, 12 seconds, can you ferment it that high? We said no, doesn't mean you can't make it a mead, though, because mead means 50% of the fermentables must come from honey. honey. Technically speaking, 50% of the fermentables came from honey. We just won't mention the other part that was distilled. Just, nope, that was a separate product. We didn't, we didn't make that. <laughs> All right. So, you see, it's kind of a joke, but at the same token, yeah, it's just something fun to try to do. And, you know, as much as a few people were very disappointed, quite a few of you out there are making your own and loving it. And I think it's awesome because that's the cool thing about homebrew is there's a million ways to do it. If you don't like one, choose another one. And if you hand your homebrew to somebody and they don't like it, well, take it back and don't give them any more. <laughs> but you know what? We're getting towards the end of this thing, but I got a joke for you. Uh-oh. That's right. I got a joke. So I know a guy whose answer to everything is alcohol. He doesn't drink. He's just really bad at crossword puzzles. <laughs> As always, guys, thank you so much for watching. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Hey, here's a quick aside. If you have any suggestions that you'd like us to cover in one of these unpasteurized episodes, please leave it in the comments below. 